All right. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome back. Oh, looks like my camera's gone. Don't know what's happened here. Uh, there we go. Okay. Fix back in. Okay. All right, here we go. Yeah, so good evening, everyone, and welcome back to another uh, Bible study. And tonight we're going to go into part two of what I um, started teaching last week, which is on the heart and in particular motives. Um, let's just open up in prayer um, before we get into tonight's word. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you that we can come together in this fashion that you are in the midst of us, even as your word declares, where we are gathered together in your name, two or three of us, you are there in the midst of us. So, Father, we thank you for your presence that's with us right now. Lord, we ask that you would give us eyes to see what you are revealing, ears to hear what you are saying, and a mind to understand revelation and truth. Father God, we pray in Jesus' name that, Lord, even as we hear your word, we would hear your voice, and that we would look into our own hearts and that father god you would speak to our hearts father god that we can deal with anything that needs to be dealt with father that our hearts would be right before you in the name of jesus lord we pray continue to strengthen us and guide us by your spirit in jesus name amen all right so um i'll do a quick recap of um what we covered what we covered uh last week um, in this series on the heart and in particular motives. Um, so we started with Proverbs 4 verse 23, which was our foundation um, scripture. And for anyone that did miss last week's teaching, it's now been uploaded onto BCM's YouTube channel. Um, so you can go into the YouTube channel now. I just uploaded it about half an hour ago. Um, and it's available there for you to watch in totality. Um, but the scripture says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it springs the issues of life. Um, and we got the understanding that that word keep means um, to guard, protect, to conceal and to watch over um, our hearts in a defensive um, and a protective, uh, protective way. So keep your heart with all diligence for out of it brings the issues of life. That's Proverbs 4.23. Um, and then another thing that we understood from last week was that our hearts are the most fertile ground in the earth. Because anything that is sown into it will grow, whether it's positive or negative. Anything that's sown into our heart will grow um another thing that we learned was that whatever grows in you when it has matured it will come out of you um it will speak out of you it will act out of you it will behave out of you um once something in our heart has matured enough to the point where it can reveal itself okay um and also in that that what speaks out of our heart, you know, the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, of the heart, the mouth speaks, um, it will speak according to what's presented to it, um, or it will act according to what's presented to it. That's why, as I mentioned last week, you can have um, a person um, that could be corrected by their boss and be fine and cool with it. And, you know, just take take the correction and carry on. But if their husband or if their sister or if their um, brother tries to correct them because they have a heart issue, that which is abundant in their heart will then manifest itself in a very different way towards them because of the individual that was presented to their heart to bring about the manifestation of the issue. Um, and then we also highlighted that whatever goes into our hearts um, has the ability to alter it positively or negatively okay um and finally i'll just mention in in, in recapping um that when our hearts are altered it does impact our actions 
and also the quality of our decisions because our heart there is a link between our heart and the soul of humanity the mind the will and the emotions okay so that's just a quick recap of last week but if you go back and watch it if you haven't you'll get a lot more in-depth understanding of what we went into um but i'm going to continue on now in looking at the heart and and the subject of motives um i'm i want to um start with jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 um and tonight i'm going to focus in more on motives manifested um motives manifested and we'll also look a bit at god's selection um, selection system or his selection process but let's start with jeremiah okay and as i did last week i'm uh I'm going retro and using a uh, physical Bible rather than a digital one. So it might take me longer than you to get to the scripture. Um, but we'll get there in the end. All right. So Jeremiah 29 verse 11. And it says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. Now, if you read that scripture, I was reading there in the New King James Version. If you read it in the King James translation, it reads slightly differently. It says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil. But this bit's different. It says to give you an expected end. OK, an expected end. So how can God have an expected end for us? It's because he knows the end from the beginning. And also it's because he knows what he desired our end to be. So our end is determined and the expected end is determined by what was in God's heart when he uh, created us. And he, and also when, when, he say, when he saved us, when Jesus saved you and I, he saved us for a particular reason and purpose because he has an expected end for us according to what he desires for us in his heart okay so he says i know the thoughts he knows how he thinks uh towards us and as the bible very clearly makes it known it says god's thought towards god's thoughts towards us are of peace um and not of evil so god doesn't have bad thoughts towards us which then means he doesn't have bad motives towards us God's motives towards us are, are, are of peace and are good. Okay. Um, now let's go to um, 1 Corinthians 13, because I want to add on to what I've just said, said there about God's, God's heart and God's motive towards us. Now, you know, we many of us could probably quote this scripture off the top of our heads um, because we've heard it so many times um, at weddings, um, you know, in, in regards to, to marriage and the, the minister or the pastor or priest will read, um, you know, 1 Corinthians 13 within the context of, you know, uh, a husband and a wife loving each other. But God is saying more. Um, more than that it's not that that's wrong it's that's that's good um to do and i think it's right to admonish people to love in this way um but there's more to it than that um so i'm going to read from uh verse one to eight for us though i speak with the tongues of men and of angels but have not love i have become a sounding brass and a clanging cymbal and though i have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. I repeat, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes uh, all things, endures all things. And then it finishes by saying, love never fails. Okay, love never fails. Now I wanna zone in specifically on verse two for a moment that 
Paul would say, even though, um, excuse me, I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, he says, but if I do not have love, he says, I am nothing, um, which is a profound and a very powerful statement um, to state that, that you are nothing if you do not have love. Now, why would Paul say this? Um, here's a key point for tonight's teaching. You cannot truly be somebody in God's kingdom if you do not have the heart of the king of the kingdom. I'll repeat that again. You cannot truly be somebody in God's kingdom if you do not have the heart of the king of the kingdom. So even though Paul was tremendously gifted, tremendously anointed, had incredible faith, he understood that having the heart of the king, having a heart of love, which is what God has towards us, is essential and without it, we are truly nothing, because if God is love and he saved us by love, then if we are in a relationship with him, which is a love relationship, then surely his love that has been given to us should um, cause a love to manifest in us and be, and be in us and dwell in us. OK, so what Paul is really sharing here with us when he now begins to break down love and he says love is patient, it's kind, um, it's not proud, etc. Paul is really sharing with us God's heart. And he's really saying to the church, this is what God's heart is. And, he, and if you think about God's heart, with every example he gives of God's heart, God's, um, he says love is patient. We know God is patient with us. God is patient with humanity. Why? Because God is love. So now when we read this scripture, um, we are really seeing God's heart towards humanity because we can look on all of these examples that Paul lists for us. And even with our own personal lives, we could see the examples of God's love in our um, in our lives. And also, not only is he sharing um God's heart with us in how God feels towards us and ultimately what God's motives towards us are birthed out of but then also it takes it a step far further in that this is the heart that God wants us to have okay um you know he wants us to be kind now some people would say you know Paul shouldn't even have to say that but yet he does um, and truth be told, if you've been in Christianity long enough and you've been around long enough, um, you'll know you can be in church sometimes and somebody can be filled with the spirit of God and yet still not be kind. It shouldn't be so. Um, as children of the king, having his spiritual DNA, we should manifest um, his, his, his heart. We should manifest his love. We should manifest his behaviors. So we should desire to have God's heart. And we should look at this. And even as he lists all of these things, we should um, look at it. And if we see, even within ourselves, we, we could say, you know what? Being honest and being transparent with myself, actually, I'm not, I'm not a patient person. That's something then that as individuals, we should work on. And we say, God, I want your heart because our desire should be to have God's heart. Because if we have God's heart, we will carry God's motives. And if we carry God's motives, we will manifest God's behavior because we will do things from the right heart and the right desire. So in wanting God's heart, then if I don't have God's heart, I will say, God, in this area, I may be recognized, I have your heart. I am I'm a kind person, but actually when it comes to patience, God, I'm not patient. God, I need your heart. Help me to be more patient. Now that's a hard prayer to pray in some contexts because the Bible says the trying of our faith produces patience. And the truth is many of us don't want to be tried, but if you want patience, you're going to have to be tried in order to grow patience. But we want to have God's heart so badly that whatever it requires, God, I want your heart. So even if I have to go through a difficult season of learning to deal with people and, and be more patient, if at the end of it, I have more of your heart, it's worth it because it will only lead 
to more of God being manifested in our lives. Okay, let's look at God's heart a bit further. John 3.16, which, I mean, we could quote it, but I want to read it just to make sure I don't get any bit wrong. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Hallelujah. All right, I'm going to read verse 16 and 17. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever be believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him uh, might be saved. Okay, so scripture says, For God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. Now, when the scripture says so, so loved, what it's really saying is, is God loved us in this way. So God showed and demonstrated his love. Um, and he demonstrated his love out of the abundance, out of the overflow of what was in his heart towards us and the motive that was there. So the motive in God's heart was, I want to save humanity. And so out of that love, he showed his love in the way that he manifested himself in the form of Jesus Christ, sacrificed himself for us, that we could, we could be saved. So the motive and the root out of which Jesus came was love. So now what Jesus is to us is Jesus is the manifested love of God. He is the manifested love of God, and also he is the manifested motive of God, okay? And because he's the manifested love of God and the manifested motive of God, for that, we can trust him. And that's why we present God as a loving savior, because when we look at what he's done, and not only beyond what he, and not just what he's done, but when we look beyond to the root of why he did what he did, and we see the purity of the motive, it should say to us, I can trust God. Because his thoughts towards me are good and not evil. He loved me so much that he would sacrifice his son for me, that I might, might be saved and that my life may be transformed. So. Another aspect of this now, we talked about last week in terms of God in the heart. Another thing that we should get, if we think about God as Jesus, as the manifested love of God and the manifested motive of God, that now also should say to us that I don't need to guard my heart from God. Now, last week we talked about the need at times to guard our heart from people. But as it pertains to God, we don't need to guard our heart from him because he will never treat our heart in a way that is hazardous to our heart. He will only treat our heart in a delicate way because of his love for us. Okay. So um, now I want to go a step, uh, a step further. Um, and I want to look further at motives now, but through the lives of two individuals. So we're going to start by looking at King Saul. Um, let's go to first Samuel chapter eight. Okay. First Samuel chapter eight. All right. And I'm going to just begin to read, uh, Samuel chapter eight. But then I want to pull out and extract some things from this passage of scripture that God brought to my attention as it pertains to the heart and motives. OK, it says now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel and the name of his second son, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes and perverted justice. Now, let's pause there a second. Now, we know Samuel to be a mighty and a powerful prophet who truly had the heart of God and upholded the standards of God and the word of God. 
he has two sons, but now verse three makes it very clear. It said, but his sons did not walk in his ways. Now, in understanding motives, in particular, when we look at what we studied last week about the heart, the reason why um, the reason why the, um, Samuel's sons didn't walk in his ways is because they did not have the heart that Samuel had. Samuel's ways was according to his heart, how he felt towards God, his motives towards God, his love for God that determined, remember, whatever is sown into our heart, when it's manifested, it would either be, can either be positive or negative. Because of what was manif um, what manifested out of Samuel's heart was positive, a positive and a pure love for God, a love for his word, a love for his standards. And remember what goes into our heart has the ability and the capacity to alter it, whether positively or negatively. So now we have a father whose heart has been positively altered by the love of God that he would walk in a way that's pleasing to God. And yet the son that come out of his loins, who he would have trained to walk in the right ways as um, uh, of God, yet for whatever reason, their heart was not right. And because their heart wasn't right, their motives weren't right, and their actions weren't right. So now the scripture makes it clear. It says, they turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes, and perverted justice. Now, now note that, that word turned aside, or that freight point turned aside. That's important. Why? Because as Samuel's sons, as I said, they would have been trained in the right way to do things. So if they were turned aside, they were turned aside from the path of righteousness and the path of uprightness as judges in, uh, in the land and amongst the people. And in being turned aside from whatever went into their heart, they now went after dishonest gain, took bribes and perverted, distorted, corrupted justice. Now, let's take that a step further. First Timothy 6, we're going to come back to um, Samuel uh, chapter 8 just in a moment, but I want to enhance the point with First Timothy um, 6. Okay. 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 First Timothy 6 and verse 10, popular scripture, we know it, it says, for, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now, this is exactly what happened with Samuel's sons. Remember, you know, so many people use scriptures as catchphrases and, and as cliches and just say, oh, you know, they'd say, oh, um, money is the root of all evil. But no, the Bible doesn't say that. Uh, the Bible says the love. And where does love come from? The heart. So the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, not just all evil, but it says all kinds of evil. So there are different kinds of evil. And when we look at Samuel's sons now, we saw that they went after dishonest gain. That's one kind of evil. They took bribes. That's another kind of evil. They perverted justice, another kind of evil because of their love um, love for money and as it says many strayed from the faith which they did in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows which Samuel's sons certainly did okay let's go further then all the elders sorry verse four then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him look you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Okay, now let's look at that again. It says, now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. All the other nations that were around about them, they wanted to be judged in the exact same fashion, having a physical um, king, a physical representation um, of, of, of a leader. Um, to, to, to guide and to, to, to rule them and to, to direct them. Okay, now what this is, based on what we studied last week, remember when um, 
the Bible says, what's it, uh, guard your heart with all diligence for out of it, the, it springs forth the issues of life. You see, what matured in their heart was idolatry. Idolatry matured in their heart until it manifested out of them. And how did it manifest out of them? What does the Bible say? Out of the abundance of the heart or out, out of the over, abundant overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So now they speak forth and they say, um, make us a king um, that we can be ju to judge us like all the, all the nations. So they came out of idol worship in Egypt, but idolatry continued to exist in the heart of their pe of the people and then when it matured enough it manifested and they said no nah, we want we want a king just like all the other nations uh have okay let's go further verse six but the thing displeased samuel when he said when sorry when they said give us a king to judge us so samuel prayed to the lord and the lord said to samuel Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. So now what we see here with the children of Israel is a, 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 a transition or a shift where they are wanting to go from having from operating and living under a theocracy which is where God is their king and their leader, to now a monarchy stroke dictatorship, because we know eventually the way Samuel's going, Saul was going to become, um, he'd be like a dictator. Um, but they wanted that monarchy style leadership. They wanted a physical representation that they could look to, that they could see, that they could feel and touch. But its root really came out of um, idolatry. Okay, verse eight. Uh, according to all the works which they um, according to all the works which they had they had done um, they so according to all the works which they had done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt even to this day with which they have forsaken me and served other gods so they are doing to you also now therefore heed their voice however you shall solemnly warn them and show them the behavior of the king whom will who will reign over them okay now i want to pause there note what god says now therefore heed their voice however you shall solemnly warn them and show them the behavior of the king now the behavior of the king would be manifested or would be the manifestation of what is in that king's heart OK, so. Um, so now Saul begins to speak to them and tell them about the behavior of the king. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his his uh, horsemen. And some will run before his chariot, chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. Will set some to plough his ground and reap his harvest. And some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, your olive groves, um, and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. And he will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men and your donkeys and put them to work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have uh, chosen for yourself. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but we will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Okay, so now in verse 20, he uses the term and they say our king, okay? And that term highlights a position 
that God should have occupied in their lives. God should have been their king, but now they wanted their own king. So they wanted a man who would now come as a, uh, as a figurehead and he would take the place in their hearts uh, and in their lives that really God should, should occupy. Okay, now note this, God says to Samuel, he says, heed, heed their words. He says, okay, this is what they want. I'll give them what they want. Now, that's to say, you see, when it comes to our hearts, you see, we should guard our hearts because if the wrong thing gets into our hearts and we allow the wrong things to grow in our hearts, it will once again influence our behavior, our actions. It will alter and, uh, and hinder our judgment. And God can say to you, all right, that's what you want. Okay, I'll let you have what you want. God will speak to you and he'll say, don't do this. Or I think you should take this cause of action. But God will not overstep the boundaries of violating your will. He won't do that. So even if he's given you a direction and a directive to do something or not to do something, we have the will to choose. But if we choose out of our hearts to do the wrong things, God said, okay, that's what you want. Okay, go on then, you have it. And when we have it, we can get the consequences with it, which commonly if we're disobeying God, it will be bad. Okay. But he won't enforce his will upon us. So this is another reason why guarding our heart is so important and checking our motives is so important because if we're operating out of the wrong motives, the things that we will reap as, uh, um, because of it can set us back, can hinder our lives, can cause greater problems because we're not operating out of a pure heart and out of good motives. So this is why we need to check our hearts and ask God to, to purify our hearts. Just like David said, create in me a clean heart, dear God and renew a right spirit uh, within me. Okay, let's go further now looking at Saul. Let's go to chapter 10 of 1 Samuel. And let's look at what God did. So the people say, we want, we want our own king. And God says, okay, that's what you want. Okay, I'm going to give him to you. Um, and he warns them about what this king will be like for them but notice this and this is where I say this is I find this teaching and and what we're learning very humbling because what it demonstrates is you can be walking with God and be walking right with God in one season but if you don't guard your heart and if you if and veer away from the truth if you turn aside from the truth you can find yourself in all kinds of mess and madness that wasn't God's intention. Because remember this, God's intention towards us are good and not evil. And now I'm going to prove it in scripture. Okay. Um, chapter 10, I want to read from verse three to five of first, Sam, um, first Samuel. Uh, it says, after that, you shall come to the hill of God. This is Samuel giving instruction to Saul. He says, after that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen when you come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high, from, a, from the high place with a, a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute and a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. Then the spirit of the Lord of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. OK, note that when the prophets came down. God's very clear. He said that Saul would be turned into another man. Now, how does God turn Saul into another man? He does it the same way he turns us into a new man or a new woman. Let's read on. And let it be that when these signs come to you, that you do as the occasion demands. For God is with you. You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and surely I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and make sa sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you will wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So it was when he had turned uh, his back to, 
to go when he had turned his back to go from Samuel. Now note this. That God gave him another heart. OK, now remember verse six, it said that when the prophets would come, Saul would be turned into another man. So how did God turn him into another man? The Bible says that he gave him another heart. So Saul had a heart before this encounter. All right. Um, we know he was a good looking man because the Bible says that he was strong and he looked all, all together. And the people were pleased to have him because of how he looked based on the externals. No, no. But Saul had a heart and within his heart was um, desires, was motives, etc. And so now when God encounters him, God gives him a new heart so that he could rule righteously. Why would God give him a new heart? Because God did not want Saul to fail. Okay. It wasn't his desire that Saul would fail. So he gives him a new heart. And with that new heart now is the uh, capacity for good, the capacity for righteousness, the capacity to obey God, to please God, and to do that which God desires um, to be done. But the, the mistake that Saul made uh, is that Saul didn't guard the new heart that God had given him. Okay. So it goes on uh, to say uh, now that when they, verse 10, when they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets uh, to meet him. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon him and he prophesied among them. Now, how is it that Saul could have prophesied? Saul was able to prophesy because of the new heart that he had, because when uh, to, to truly prophesy by the spirit of God, you need to have the heart of God. OK, because you were speaking forth the things that God desires. What does the Bible say about prophecy? It said it's there for um, edification, for comfort, um, etc. All right. So Saul now had a new heart and he now had the, the, the tools or the ability and the capacity to be able to obey and to please God. But we know Saul did not do that uh, and he messed up. So let's go now um, to where is it, to chapter 13, okay, and I'm not going to read the, uh, the whole chapter, I'm just going to read part of it, and then extract some things from it, you can read the whole chapter in your time if you wish, okay, now remember, the commandment that God gave to Saul through the prophet Samuel in verse, uh, sorry, in chapter 10, um, and verse, where is it, and verse 8, it said, um, seven days you shall wait, till I come to you and show you what you must do, okay? That is the commandment that God was given to uh, Saul through the prophet um, Samuel. Now we jump over to verse 13, uh, sorry, chapter 13, uh, reading from verse 11. Um, it now says, and Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed within those seven days, and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash. Then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you, um, you have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. So now let's just pause there a moment. OK, so now we get this understanding. OK, God's God's clearly stated here in verse 13. He would have established Saul's kingdom forever. OK, um, uh, oh, his kingdom over Israel forever if he had obeyed. OK, so he had this new heart. He had the ability to obey, but because he didn't guard his heart and he allowed other things to get in his heart, that when it manifested, he disobeyed God. Now he found himself being rejected, whereas if he had done right, God would have established his kingdom. OK, so now that's a that's a message to you and I that 
God changes our heart and he puts good things in our heart. But if we continually, if we continually do wrong, then we can lose out on what God really has for us. That expected end that God desires for us, we can cancel ourselves out of it. If we do not guard our hearts from the, the, the bad things, from the corrupt things, <clears throat> from the evil things that would seek to enter into our heart, to grow in our heart, and manifest our heart. God's desire for us is that we should have blessings, um, that we should walk in, in, in good things, that we should experience the best of life and have the abundant life experience. But if we do not guard our hearts from things that are contrary to God's word, we can discount or cancel ourselves out of the very blessings of God that he desires to give to us. So we have to watch, as the Bible says, guard your heart with all diligence or watch over your heart with all diligence. We have to watch over our hearts to see what is going into my heart. What is what is happening in my heart? This situation that's frustrating me right now. Is there something that's gone into my heart as a result of it? Is it doing something in my heart that needs to be addressed? And if something needs to be taken out of my heart, God, take it out quickly. Take it out now that it doesn't take out in seed form before it, it's able to get its roots in my heart and begin to grow that would cause all kinds of problems or it would cause me to, to, to cast aside a blessing that you really wanted to give me or something good that you wanted to do in my life. Okay, um, so, so it says, was it here? The Lord, um, now verse 14, it says, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after uh, his, his own heart. Now, let's go back now in that verse, uh, verse 11, let's say 11 to 13. Okay. Now, I mentioned that God gave Saul a new heart. He needed to guard and protect that heart, watch over that heart, but he didn't do that. Okay, so now something entered into his heart or some things entered into his heart that caused him to disobey God. Um, I'm of the opinion that the things that entered into his heart was probably the things that existed before God had to give him a new heart. OK, because the enemy will oftentimes take you back, try and take you back to what you had before when our hearts weren't right. OK, so. Um, you know, I've, I, for example, I've, um, I often use the term that there is a tailor-made sin for everybody. Why? Because Hebrews, I believe it's Hebrews 12, um, says that we should be weary of the sin that does easily beset us. How can we have a sin that easily beset us if it's not tailor-made to us? Okay, so now when we look at Saul, um, my belief is this from the scripture. Saul's issue was pride. Saul's issue was pride and pride exists in the heart and pride is a dangerous thing. What does the Bible say in first John? It says, I'll be first John chapter one, I think verse 10, it says for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Okay. So now um, when we look uh, at Saul, he, he speaks about, you know, um, first it's a couple of things he does here. Now we look uh, um, when Samuel confronts Saul and he says, what have you done? Uh, Paul, uh, Saul says, when I saw what the people, uh, that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the, the appointed days and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will come down onto me at Gilgal and I have not made supplication, uh, to the Lord. And now note this, he says, therefore I felt compelled. Now notice the word I, I felt compelled. It's not God compelled me. No, I felt compelled um, and offered burnt offerings. So Saul took it upon himself to now enter into, he was presumptuous, presumptuous, you can be presumptuous out of pride. And he took on the role of a Levite. It's the Levites who are supposed to be in the temple and offering sacrifices um, and, and doing those things. But he took it upon himself and he now... Um, operated within an area of jurisdiction that he had no right to operate okay and there's a similarity between Saul's sin 
and Satan's sin when he was Lucifer in heaven, because the Bible tells us in Ezekiel, um, when it gives us the understanding of, of why Lucifer was kicked out, it said that he said, I will ascend into the mountain of God. Um, I will, uh, I believe, ascend up to the clouds. And he says, I will be like the most high. So um, uh, Lucifer's sin was pride entered into his heart and he now sought to occupy a position that was not rightfully his. OK, now Saul did a similar thing. He went and sought to occupy a position that he had no right to occupy. And he tried to uh, and, and, as if to say, I'm the leader. I can make the decision. I can do this and it will just be OK. But that wasn't the commandment that God had given him. So he stepped up, uh, tried to step above God's commandment to do what he thought was right, because, as he said, he felt compelled. But. God never told him to do it. OK, so there were some important lessons to learn from Saul's disqualification. OK, um, lesson number one, you can be called and selected by God and yet still disqualify yourself from receiving his promises. OK, I'll repeat that again. You can be called and selected by God and yet be dis and yet to still disqualify yourself from receiving his promises all right lesson number two god gave saul a new heart when he called him but he didn't protect the new heart that had that had been given to him and so old issues re-entered his heart that ended up manifesting in his life okay and they didn't just manifest in his disobeying god they continued to manifest now let's look at what actually happened now to Saul's heart when it began to get corrupted remember out of the abundance or the abundant overflow of the heart um, springs forth the issues of life the mouth will speak the actions will be manifested okay so let's go to first Samuel um first Samuel 15 First uh, Samuel 15, and I'm going to read from verse 12 to 17. It says, so when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel saying, Saul went up to Carmel and indeed he set up a monument for himself. Not a monument for God, a monument for himself. What was this? This was the manifestation. This was his behaviors according to his altered heart that were now been corrupted okay so pride was in his heart selfishness came in his heart idolatry came in his heart and now he sets up a monument for himself and he has gone on and he has gone on around passed by and down to Gilgal verse 13 then Samuel went to Saul and Saul said to him blessed are you the um, blessed are you of the Lord I have performed the commandment of the Lord but Samuel said, what then is this bleating of the of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen, which I hear? Now, Saul should have had enough sense to know if I'm talking to a, a, a bona fide, verified, certified prophet, that he's going to know if I've done right or wrong. But what does Saul try and do? Saul tries to, tries to lie and say, look, I've done everything that God said try to cover up why once again manifestation of the corruption that was now not only in his heart but that had matured in his heart to the point that it could alter his behavior and change his behavior to do what was wrong verse 15 and Saul said they are uh, they have brought down sorry they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you over to anoint you king over israel now this is a key point okay remember i said about pride 
in the in the life and in the heart of um uh of of Saul. Look what God says. He said, when you were little in your own eyes. Now remember, let's look at the process. The people want a king. So they say, God, give us a king. God says, okay, I'm going to give you a king and I'm going to tell you the kind of king you're going to have and what he's going to do. And he says about all the things that he would do, but yet God chooses Saul and in choosing him, he gives him a new heart. Now Saul makes the mistake. He doesn't protect that heart and he doesn't guard that heart continually because remember the bible uh, last week we sp spoke about uh, when the bible talks about being diligent in certain things and that we need to be diligent in the protecting of our hearts now Saul when his heart was uh, God gave him a new heart needed to be diligent continually in watching over his heart but now note this God says through Samuel when you were little in your own eyes what is that when you were humble Saul um, Saul did not continue to remain in humility in his heart and humility was a defense okay and even for us now let me say this is a lesson for us humility is a defense for our hearts what does the bible say humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and in due time he will lift us up what does the bible say in Philippians uh chapter two it says that Jesus made himself of what no reputation and became obedient unto death even on the death even the death of a cross therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every other name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall uh, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God okay so Jesus made himself of what no reputation humility why because humility guards your heart against pride and when Saul ceased to guard his heart with humility when he ceased to stop being humble when the power began to get to him when the position began to get to his head and he got high-minded and haughty and, and and thinking he was all that all of a sudden now his heart was exposed and pride came in and now look at all the corruption that came with it and all the problems that came with it. Okay, so that's an important lesson for, for us all. Be humble. Humility is essential in protecting the heart because if you're not humble and you're proud, what does the Bible say? When pride comes, it says pride comes before what? A fall. Because the only way to really get pride out of your heart is that it has to be exposed by a fall or an embarrassment that would humble you that your heart can now be reconditioned back to a, to a, to a humble and a, um, state of humility. I hope that makes sense. Okay, um, let's continue. How are we doing for time? Okay, we're doing okay. Um, okay, now let's, we've looked at Saul. Let's just begin to look at, at, at David now. Um, I want to go back to First uh, Samuel 13. I'm just going to read verse 14. Saul, uh, sorry, Samuel says to Saul, but now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Okay, so now God says, he, he says, okay, to the children of Israel, you lot wanted a king, I gave you a king. Excuse me, you wanted a king according to what you desired. Someone that was good looking, someone that had the right physique, the right stature, maybe said the right things, etc. And this is what it's got you. He says, now I'm going to select a king for myself. Okay, you wanted a king to roll over you, it didn't work. And you're going to see that it hasn't worked because we see like Saul's life play out. Um, but he says, I'm going to select a king for myself now. And God's first thing that he looks for, he says, the Lord has sought. He has gone and looked for um, uh, for himself a man after his own heart. Now, there are two interpret interpretations that theologians uh, tend to use as it pertains to um, David being a man after God's own heart. One interpretation is this, that David was a man who was seeking after the heart of God, 
to have God's heart. The other interpretation is that within David existed the same heart as what God already had. And so that's why God wanted him. All right. Now, if we go into chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, uh, and we'll go to verse 4, and then read down. It says, so, uh, so I'll repeat again, 1 Samuel 16 from verse 4. So Samuel did what the Lord said and went to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. So it was when, he, when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his, or his physical stature because I have refused him. Now, why would God say that? God said that because of how the people selected the king for themselves. They wanted a king that looked good, that had the right appearance, that had the right stature, et cetera, et cetera. But he says, don't look on the externals. He says, for the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So when it comes to God's selection process or God's selection system, when he chooses people, he doesn't choose them according to their ability. He chooses people according to their heart. So he looked at David and he says, I want David because of what's in David's heart. And we get to see what's in David's heart in a number um, of, of, of ways. OK, um, so in this, we see a revelation of David's heart in that. Think about this. What's in David's heart? To see what's in David's heart, we have to look at David's behavior because our heart condition will determine in many factors our behavior. So now David is anointed. All right. Uh, it goes on to say, let me actually let me read. Uh, where is it? Verse. Uh, let me read verse 13 it says then Samuel took the, the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward so Samuel arose and went to Ramah okay so now notice this David is now anointed as the king he has the power but he doesn't yet have the position but what does David do? He's got the power, but he doesn't have the position. What does he do? David serves. David serves. That right there is a manifestation of the heart and the motives of David. If you think about this, right? He doesn't just serve because he could have maybe gone and served Samuel. He could have served somebody else in a different position he goes and serves Saul he serves Saul as if Saul is still the anointed king even though he knows that he is now God's anointed that speaks to his heart one remember about humility the humility that was in David's heart is one of the reasons why God chose him because if David wasn't humble, if he was proud, he would have been up, puffed out, walking around saying, I'm now the anointed king. And he would have been going straight away, trying to take Saul out of position. He didn't do it. He served Saul. He served Saul so much that even when Saul seeks and is trying to kill him, he still serves him as if he's the anointed king, even though he knows that he is really the anointed king. Even when he had the opportunity to take his life, he still wouldn't. And he referred to Saul as the Lord's anointed, even though he knew Samuel the prophet had anointed him as king. What did he do? He served. Now, there are two powerful principles that I want to give here that um, God, God brought to my, uh, to my attention. First one is a life principle. And then the second one is a ministry principle. 
Okay, so firstly, the life principle, and I'd recommend writing it down. God cannot elevate, so God cannot elevate, uh, elevate you higher than the posture and level of humility in your heart. I'll repeat that again. God cannot elevate you higher than the posture and the level of humility in your heart. If you want to go high with God, be really humble in your heart. Because if you cannot be humble, you can't go up. Because if you're proud and you get lifted up, it will mess you up. It will corrupt you. You'll use it. Do you know what people say? Um, it's a very powerful statement. And yet it's one that I think is very true. It says, um, money and power is a revealer of people. Money and power is a revealer of people. Because if you give somebody a lot of money, or if you give somebody a lot of power, you will really see who they are. You'll see what, and by virtue of what they do with it. So it's a revealer of people. And it reveals not only people, but reveals what's truly in the hearts of people and their motives. That's life principle. Now here's a ministry principle. And I've, I've been around now long enough to see this um, for myself. And to know that this is 100% true because God told me this a number of years ago and I've seen it lived out. Key ministry principle, if you're a leader or you're going to put somebody in a position of leadership. Now, you could even say this isn't just a ministry principle. You could say this is a life principle, but we're, in the, we're talking about church. So um, let's talk from a ministry um, perspective. Here's the principle. Don't put an individual in leadership who hasn't submitted to the leadership of someone else first. If you have no evidence of somebody being submitted to another person's leadership, do not put them in leadership. Because everybody, there's a lot of people who love to be leaders, but they don't have the heart for it. Why? Because the true heart of a leader is to serve. The true heart of a leader is never about being the big I am and being uh, the, uh, uh, the, the one with all the power and, 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 and all of that. That's not what leadership's about. Real leadership is about serving. So if you can't serve someone else, you shouldn't, you're not qualified for leadership. Even you, when you say, ah, oh, but you know, I don't, I don't get along with their personality. Well, David served someone that was trying to kill him. He didn't complain about that. I mean, goodness me, you, I mean, that's a completely different level. You know, someone literally actively trying to take your life, throwing a spear straight at you, conspiring and got men hunting down to kill you. That's not the greatest of personalities. And yet David still served him. So sometimes you will have to serve serve um, in life you know it could be in a job on your day-to-day -day job but also within church and within ministry sometimes you'll have to serve another leader that you may not agree with the way they do everything you may not even necessarily like their personality yet still serve be humble enough that you can serve and that you can see the uh, uh god's hand on them and and uh the way that god um god uses them because i tell you this if you're in if you're in a team or if you're in leadership and you're under other leaders and you can't see God's hand in their life, all you can see is the things that they do wrong. There's something wrong in your heart. Let that sink in for a minute. I'm telling you. If all you can see is bad in another leader that you're serving under, there is something wrong in your heart. If you cannot see uh, any anything good in them if you cannot see uh, uh, if you cannot compliment anything about what God's doing in them all you can see is negative and bad something's wrong in your heart and unless on the rare and I will say rare occasion unless somebody is genuinely literally not doing anything good and is doing something really like doing things really bad in that circumstance okay different but generally look none of us are perfect and when it comes to leadership, do you know all leaders are flawed? Every single leader, any leader that does not think they're flawed is deceived. 
every leader is flawed in some way, shape or form in their style of leadership. Um, it may be a, a personality trait or personality flaws. All leaders are flawed. So when no leader is going to get everything right all the, all the time. But yet we should still serve one another. And if you're serving under a leader, serve, serve them and the teams and the, and the people that you're serving, serve them well. And if you are a leader, then as, as a leader, we're to serve the people and to serve them as best as, as we can. But I go back to the principle. Don't put anyone in position on your job. If you've got someone that, um, uh, if you have to put, need got a leadership vacancy, but yet there's somebody there that consistently gave the previous leader that's now left, maybe say gave them hell all the time, gave them problems all the time. The worst thing you could do is put that person in position because they weren't submitted. You know, so many people want the platform, uh, want the power, but they don't have the heart to carry it. Okay, let's move on. Oh, wait, I've noticed something in the chat. Okay, cool. Let's move on. All right, let's go to Second Samuel chapter 12. Here again, we get um, another revelation uh, of God's heart. Oh, sorry, not of God's heart, of David's heart. Second Samuel 12. And let me just say one other thing that's just dropped in my spirit about that ministry principle, okay? About, uh, I'll repeat again, don't put, a leader, don't put an individual in leadership who hasn't submitted to the leadership of someone else. Why is that? Because the truth is, there's multiple levels of leadership, okay? If you, if you cannot be led, you're not ready to lead because a higher level of leadership still requires you to be led. So let me put it in this context. Pastor is the most senior leader in our in, in BCM, okay? But yet pastor still is being led. He's a leader that is being led. And good leaders or great leaders recognize that, that even though they're a shepherd, they're still a sheep. So he leads us in many areas, but he leads us as God is leading him. So he's still submitted and still uh, humble and also not just um, uh, uh, not just how God leads him, but he'll also submit himself to other leadership. You know, you've got um, Bishop Francis, the national bishop, got other pastors who he may go to for advice at times and, and speak to other individuals. Why? So that he could be led in areas because he recognizes he doesn't know it all. He doesn't have everything. He, he, he leans upon the, the, the gifts within the body to also allow himself to be led at times where he may say, do you know, in this area, I need some leading and some leadership. OK, so Second Samuel uh, 12. OK, and I want to read now. Let's just frame this. OK, at this point now, David's in position. He's now the king. He has just committed horrendous uh, uh horrendous acts of um he's committed adultery um he has planned and orchestrated uh the murder of uriah and now nathan the prophet comes to david and this is what happens then the lord said sent nathan to david and he came to him and said to him there were two men in one city one rich and the other poor the rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. And a traveller came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who would come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who would come to him. 
So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold from the lamb for the lamb because he did this thing and he has had no pity. And then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master, I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have given you much more. Why would God have given him much more? God would have given David much more because of David's heart. How much David loved God and sought after God. Okay, verse nine. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife with your, to be your, your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of, Am, of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with uh, and uh, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel before the son. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. However, because of this deed, you, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child who is born to you shall surely die. And then Nathan departed to his house. OK, there's a few things to unpack here now. We're talking about the heart of a man and the heart of David. And we established David was humble in his heart. He proved that by the way he served. Okay. But now we find ourselves conflicted because David had this wonderful heart. From this heart, he wrote poetry to God. From this heart, he worshipped God. From this heart, he wrote the Psalms and there were so many, so there's so many great things you could say about David. And yet he would commit adultery and conspire and plan the murder of an innocent man. And yet God didn't kill him. And it would make you think, why? Because even in David doing wrong, in his heart, he was still just. And it, it's, it's amazing. How do we know? Because now when you look at the story here, when Nathan confronts David, David hears this story. And here's the thing now. If David's heart had been truly corrupt, he would have clocked on that Nathan was telling this story and that actually, as he's going through this story, he'd have put two and two together and said, hold on a second. This sounds like he's talking, I think he's about to talk about me. And then with that being so, if his heart was corrupt, he would have made some kind of scheme or some kind of way to try and wiggle, him way, wiggle his way out of being judged. But he didn't do that. Notice what happened when David heard the story. The Bible says he was angered. Why was he angered? Because even though David had done very wrong in his heart, he still had uprightness in his heart that he was angered by the injustice he was being told about, that when he heard the story, he still judged the situation righteously. And he gave a right judgment to the situation. And then at that point, he finds out he was the man that he was talking about. And I wonder if at that moment he thought, good Lord, I've just signed my own death sentence. But notice this, when he's now confronted with his sin, remember when Saul was confronted with doing wrong. Do you remember what Saul did? Go back and read it. Saul started speaking about what the people did. Instantaneously tried to divert the attention away from himself. But David 
when he's now confronted, he immediately admits his wrongdoing. He says, I have sinned against God. He was upright and just and enough, enough to admit, this isn't nobody else's doing. This is no one else's fault. I am the one who has done wrong. So it's only right that judgment comes to me. And he accepted the judgment. Yes, he did intercede and try and appeal for the life of his child, which was not successful. Uh, but he accepted that the judgment that came upon his house was as a result of what he had done as an, as an individual. Okay. So this then takes me somewhere else now, because as I looked at this now, I now look at Galatians. Let's go to Galatians chapter six. Because I think this is something that's uh, important for us as Christians to note. Because in the kingdom, we're called to be saved. We're called to live upright. We're called to be just and righteous individuals. And yet, at times, we get in trouble. And at times, people get in trouble various kinds of trouble people commit various kinds of sins do the wrong things and God says this if brethren if a man is overtaken in any in any trespass you who are spiritual uh, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness considering yourselves lest you also be tempted Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, what is the law of Christ? The law of Christ is love. Okay. Now, when I read that scripture, and this is about if a man is overtaken in a trespass, I now look at, excuse me, I look at David. And David, for me, and what happened with him and with Bathsheba and Uriah is a prime example to my eyes of a man being overtaken in a sin. David was overtaken by lust. It, it, it was so bad, it wasn't that, you can see a beautiful woman, a woman can see a beautiful man just walking down the street and see them and think, wow, they're very attractive. That's, that's human nature, but it's something else to see someone and be so overwhelmed whereby you say, I have to have it. I have to have them. And then to abuse a position of power like David had as a king to take another man's wife. And based on the, the time and society you're in, um, you know, many people would argue Bathsheba couldn't refuse the king because he was the king. He had to have her and he took her. And he lay with her and then he conspires the, the death of, of, of Uriah. This to me is an example of someone being overtaken in a sin. Why do I say that? Because when you look at David's history, you see how much he loved God. You see the depth of his heart and his desire for God. So much so that, come on, we're reading this Bible and look how long the Psalms are of all of these um letters that and 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 and, and songs of worship etc um that uh that that david wrote to god and wrote about god you know it's after this oh i just noticed a question um sister claude is asking what scripture was that i just read uh that was galatians chapter 6 verse 1 to 2 uh galatians 6 verse 1 to 2 um but yeah you look at the psalms now and david would even pen the psalm, uh, is, it, is, it, uh, is it Psalm, psalm uh, 50 or Psalm 32, where he says, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven, uh, whose sins are, uh, trespasses are forgiven um, and whose sins are covered. You know, after all that he had done and recognizing the wrong that he did, he, that he did and yet God, the Bible says that God um, forgave him and he didn't kill him. He was deserving of death for what he did, but God didn't kill him. Why? Because it's possible that a person can be overtaken by a sin 
when I think of overtaken, I think um, of a tsunami. And I, there's uh, many of you, probably all of you will probably remember um, the terrible tsunami that happened into Christmas. Was it No, was it New Year's Eve or New Year's Day 2004 um, in Thailand and that part of the world? There's one image that stays in my memory from when those events happened, and it's come up many times in documentaries about it, that there was a point when the water had gone out to sea. And that's always telling signs that a tsunami is about to happen because when there's a big earthquake underneath the, 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 the seabed, um, the tectonic plates shift and it causes the water to move out before it then comes back in. So the water had moved out and people thought it was a bit strange, but somebody was video camming. They were up on like the hills and they were video camming down on the beach. And it's a very sad image that there was now an old man, probably looked like his maybe early 70s, who was on the beach. And he didn't realize what was happening, as many people didn't. And the water had gone out, but now the water began to start coming back in. And all you see is this wall of water just coming with such force, like a huge tidal wave. And you saw it coming and the man start, the old man started trying to run away, but it got to a point where he realized he just knew he couldn't escape. And you saw him just stop and he just kind of just froze because he knew what was going to happen and he refused to look back. And then you just saw the wall of water just overtake him and he just disappeared and he was just gone. And unfortunately he did die and they found his bodies a few days later. But when I think of a person being overtaken, in a sin. I have that image in my mind that David was overtaken with lust to a point that it would even cause him to conspire murder. That is a high level of being overtaken by lust. Now, I think about David and then I think about us as people. In, as Christians and as we live in this life, and if, you get, if you've been in church for a long time, you'll know this because you've seen it yourself probably at some point. And if you've not been in, King, in, in church long enough, stick around, you'll probably see something. There can be times where people are in the kingdom, filled with the spirit of God, and they can be overtaken by a sin. And yet even though they've been overtaken by a sin, their heart has not been fully corrupted. And therefore, God would say, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gent gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Why? Because everybody has a tailor-made sin. And everybody has something that could cause them to behave or do something that is so contrary to righteousness and to truth and to kingdom living and yet in doing that now the key is how do they respond when confronted with their wrongdoing and when they come to their senses to realize oh my gosh what have I done if someone's truly repentant Truly sorry, Bible says, one, forgive them, two, show mercy and grace towards them and restore them, because they may have done wrong, but their heart may not be fully corrupted. Now, if a person's heart is truly corrupted, that they would do wrong and show no remorse, at that point, I'd say, still pray for them because their condition is very, is very bad, that they could know that they've done wrong and yet show no remorse or no repentance, that's a bad situation for an individual to be in. So now for us as believers, let's speak plainly. If issues were to happen in church, any church, could be our church, other churches, etc. somebody does something wrong, um, you know, it can be sad, it can be upsetting, it can be many things. Um, but if that person is truly repentant, 
God will forgive them. Um, and we as a church should endeavor to restore them, not to kill them, not to gossip about them, not to cast them aside. We should seek to restore them such that a soul would be saved. Now, I'm going to close on one other example. I'm not even going to read it. I'm just going to speak about it. When we look at God's motive for choosing people, another example that's great is, is Saul, who later became Paul. The Bible says God chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Many people would say that God would be foolish or that God was foolish to choose Saul to be the individual who would end up writing, was it two thirds of New Testament scripture? The apostle to not only the Jews, but to the Gentiles, etc., called to speak to kings and rulers and leaders. Um, but when God chose Saul, who became Paul, why did he choose him? Once again, his heart. Saul was consenting to the murder of Stephen. He was imprisoning Christians. He put much suffering on the New Testament church. And yet God saw his actions and saw his heart and said, if this man is so zealous to uphold the law and to fight so vigorously against anything that in his sight would seem to be contrary or against the law, what would he do if he knows the kingdom, if he knows Jesus? And so, and so God chooses him based on his heart so now when Saul gets chosen and he's converted think about this now <laughs> and this is what many of us would be like you see this is where now the church we need we need help because when Saul was converted to Paul the church didn't want to receive him because they had heard about all that he had done they had heard about the power and the authority he had to imprison Christians they were scared of him so God had to set someone up that they respect, I think it was Barnabas, um, to make account for Paul to say, I know you know what he did, but you need to know, um, but God has saved him. And you will see that he saved him by virtue of his actions. Why? Because now listen to what he's preaching. Listen to what he's teaching. Look at how he's living. You know, even with, um, uh, was, it, uh, was it Ananias um, that, that God told to go to, to, to Paul when he was still Saul? And what's the first thing that he said? He said, I've heard about this man. I've heard about him and I've heard about what he's doing. But God says, I've called him. I've chosen him. Why did God choose him? He chose him based on what was in his heart. Last example and I close. That's a good example with, with Saul being converted to Paul. Let's look at a negative example. I can't remember the scripture off the top of my head, but the Bible says when it comes to Judas, was God wrong in choosing Judas? No. Jesus chose Judas as a disciple and he was right to do so. Why? Because he had the ability and the capacity to do right. He should have been one of the 12 apostles. But what happened? He didn't guard his heart. He was a money collector. And greed and corruption entered into his heart. What did the Bible say? The Bible says this about Judas. It said that Satan entered him. And from that point, he saw how he could betray Jesus. How did Satan enter Judas? He entered into his heart. He, he used a love of money, greed, etc., and sowed it into his heart. And because his heart wasn't guarded against the things that he had a weakness for, he then from that point was turned. Not only was his heart corrupted, but his mind was corrupted that now he was actively looking for the opportunity whereby he could sell, sell out Jesus. And then after selling him out and then realizing what he had done, the Bible says he was so sorrowful. And then he, he, he went and, um, and, he, and he, we, was he killed himself or his life, his life um, ended. But he was extremely sorrowful. Why now? Because he had an awakening as to what he had really done. But where did that corruption start that would lead to him doing that? Started in his heart. So I close on the scripture that we used as our foundation. Proverbs 4, 
23. Keep your heart, watch over your heart, conceal your heart, uh, protect your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. As we live day by day, we have to guard our hearts. Why? In our day-to-day -day lives, we will have disagreements with people, okay? Could be a spouse, could be a person at work, could be a child, could be a parent, could just be any, any person, any Joe Blogs on the street. We can have disagreements with people. We can be angry, okay? We can get angry because of situations. Uh, we can be hurt. We can uh, feel uh, unforgiveness once take play uh, come into our heart etc and things like that but we have to guard our heart and we have to actively be watching over our hearts not only from an external to watch out to be careful of what people may be trying to put in our hearts through what they say or through what they do but also watching over our hearts to say okay god is there anything in my heart that, that right, you're not happy with? Is there anything in my heart that's dangerous right now? Is there anything in my heart that's going to keep me from being where you want me to be or doing what you want me to do? Watching over our hearts, like it says, with all diligence, meaning being consistent with it, continuously doing it. Because it's so easy. I tell you, you just ask anyone that's, <laughs> ask anyone that's married. It's so easy for the enemy to, uh, uh, to, to, to plant resentment in your heart. Just let you have an argument with your spouse, okay? And you have that argument. And then come on now, and, and I know I'm not the only one that this happens to, okay? You have an argument, and then the person, they may go to sleep or they may leave and go to work or whatever. And for the whole day, you're going over in your mind every argument or everything you should have said in the argument that would have got your points across even better. Now... Is that God? No. It's, it's, it's our minds remunerating, but also it's, it can very well many times be the enemy planting seeds in our mind. And then let that take root long enough. Next thing, you know, you, you could, your, your spouse could come home and could be completely got over what happened, the argument in the morning, and now you're looking at them sideways. <laughs> and now you're being short with them you're being sharp with them it can be your spouse it can be your children it could be a parent it could be someone at work but the enemy is so certain how he operates and things can very easily end up in our heart that if we let it stay there long enough it will do real damage because next thing now it will mature the resentment can mature the anger can mature uh the the bitterness the hatred whatever it may be the unforgiveness uh, the, you know, the pride, the greed, um, you know, can mature, the lust can mature. And when it matures long enough, it will reveal itself in either in our words or reveal itself in our actions. So God's encouragement to all of us is guard our hearts, watch over them and be quick. When you see anything that's not good in your heart, be quick to take it before God and say, God, deal with this issue in my heart and take it out of me or show me what I need to do to get it out of me so that I can do what's right and not give room or space for the enemy to be able to come in and cause any kind of disruption, corruption or anything else in my life. All right, I'm going to close. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for what you've spoken to us over these last two sessions about our hearts and motives father we ask in jesus name that lord you would speak to us and you would reveal to us our own hearts father anything in our hearts that is not aligned to your word and to your truth and to your desire for us anything in our hearts that is not aligned to your heart father we ask that you would speak to us about it minister to us and deal with it father if there are truthfully things in our hearts that are deep seeded, rooted and grounded because they've been there for years and we've been avoiding it, we've been running from it, been afraid to address it and open up that part of our lives. Father God, I pray from this day that we would have fear no more, that Father, we would open up that area of our hearts and of our lives onto you and allow you to minister to us 
that father if there's brokenness in our hearts it would be healed if there's pain in our hearts it would be removed if there's lust in our hearts it would be removed uh, if there's bitterness in our hearts father god let it be destroyed by the love of christ and by the peace and the mercy of god father god we pray that you would administer your remedy and your solution to our hearts that father we can be whole and that we can walk before you in a righteous manner in jesus name we pray amen amen god bless you all have a god fantastic rest of thursday good night thank you have a blessed night everyone god, god bless, bless you, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you god bless